Welcome to Honey Badger Radio's Fireside Chat number 60. We are going to be talking about the Red Pill documentary and uh, maybe other things sort of relevant to it with uh, our, well, we have a resident feminist guest, Brittany Simon. Hi. Hello, Brittany. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. So um, before we get into the topic, there's some things I want to say. You and I talked about this a little bit before I started the stream, but I want to repeat this for the audience. Uh, this is not going to be a debate in some sort of formal, you know, ponage kind of way. I think that those can be um, less useful. I mean, there's definitely a place for that, okay? But I think that when people are talking about these kinds of issues, for the most part... Um, uh, people are thinking about like how best to solve problems. And I think that us talking about them in a way that is uh, less about trying to simply, you know, win the discussion and more about trying to like figure out what we're, you know, how we're looking at this differently, what, what wor what's working, what's not working. Uh, I think that's a better way to approach the discussion. So just so you guys know, this is not going to be like something like that. Although I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be honest about what I think about stuff and I'm not going to, you know, change my, uh, the way that I talk or whatever, just to, you know, uh, create some veneer of, um, comfort because I think that honesty is better, but that's just me. And I don't yeah. expect you to do that either. So is that fair? Yes, of course. Okay, great. So, um, the reason why I invited you on was I watched your, um, your video, which was a review, I guess, or reflection on Cassie J's documentary, The Red Pill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got about halfway through it and I thought I should probably extend an invitation. So I was the one that sent you the message. Well, thank you. And um, I thought that there were some things that, you know, maybe we could like uh, sink our teeth into and chew on. And maybe there's some, you know, areas where it looked, you know, I felt that you may have had a blind spot on some of the issues or at least the ways that, you know, um, the film may have presented an idea and how we're both looking at them a bit differently. Um, so I thought, you know, we should have a dialogue. It's better to do that than to just say, you know, let me stay in my side of this discussion and just be mad about it. I, I, and it's always better to reach out to people. So, I thought I would do that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, honestly, I made that I made that initial review because so many people had asked me to. And uh, listen, I got sent that particular Cassie J's documentary by anti-feminists who were like, Brittany, watch this. You won't be a feminist anymore. I love you. I watch your stuff. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. So it was hard because I went in already like with this preconceived notion that it was like dogma trying to convert like feminists into anti-feminism so mm -hmm. i already had these glasses on and i was trying so hard not to like wear them but it was you know it's hard to keep that bias out especially when the film is like presented that way from people but um i i knew my audience would see it and then i was hoping some other people would see it and i was hoping that i would get good conversation from people who weren't my exact audience and i was able to weed through the comments that were like you're ugly. And I was like, okay. And then I looked for the comments that really were constructive. I mean, um, and there were many, there were so many, and I really enjoyed that. Even now people are still going back and forth and I really enjoy that. So, I mean, that's the whole point. I don't know how much you know about my channel in general, but the whole focus of it is living, you know, happy and authentically in alternative lifestyles, but also paying attention to how the government and the law affects those lifestyles and those freedoms. So when we talk about feminism, it directly correlates into living alternative relationships and identities and all these things. So, um, you, you know, you can pretend you're in a bubble as much as you want, but you know, you have a world to interact with. So I am excited by this because I didn't expect this interaction to occur. Um, I don't consider myself large enough to, you know, get people's attention, but I am glad that we can have this discussion because I think something good might come out of it. If you're listening to this after the live show and you want to hear the full stream, go to www.honeybadgerradio.com for our unabridged podcasts or look up to the right of this video. There's a link to go directly to the unabridged version on YouTube. So let me ask you this, since you were talking about uh, the what we call the 36 flavors of feminism. Do you think yeah. that uh, we already know about that, you know, how there are different kinds and all that. Do you think that there is anything that unifies all of them? Like how... What do you do if you're a feminist and you're making up a new brand or a new type of feminism, um, but you want to make sure it can still be called feminism? So what, is the, what are the things that you think are core 
pillars of feminism that all fem- feminisms have in common? Well, I think that the first thing that comes reflexively to my brain is that feminism should be the focus of liberating and creating equality for women in the world. But that also focuses all of our efforts in helping women. And that's women of all kinds of women. Like that's not excluding sure. trans women or anything of that nature, which is a part of like old school feminist thought. And we acknowledge that it which is why you hear words like intersexual, like inter- intersectional. You know, inter- intersectional. And so that's a part of like thought processes that have been, you know, explored and that's great. But I, I don't, I want to say this because I hear a lot of people talk about feminism in a very interesting concept, which is that it's, we say it's for equality, not because we're fighting equally as hard for men's rights. I don't know where we pretend that was ever the point. I think the point was always to focus on females' rights in relation to men's rights. And then we create a world where we're all on the same page so we can go forward and not worry about focusing on either or. Mm -hmm. Like as as a queer woman myself, like I focus on queer rights, but that doesn't mean I'm excluding straight people's rights. I just want us to get to a point where we can just move on from it, but we Mm -hmm. have to get there first. So I, I, I feel like feminism, the thing that unifies all the thoughts is that it's there to give women the, um, the, same brings us to the same playing field. But once we accomplish that, I'm not quite sure what they want us to do after. And I'm not sure that it ever needs to go away or needs to always stay. But I'm, I would say that was the collective thought that definitely would bring us all together. It's what makes us feel like we understand each other, I think. I'm making a distinction between um, people who are anti-feminist because they don't tend to be activists. They're just... Um, Mostly, they're you know it, that's a, a mixed bag, versus MRAs that actually say, well, we want to get these things done. Yes. So, okay, I will have to preface this with I admit that when I watched the Red Pill, I did understand better. I think the um, like a voice for men who I had seen before and I had read their blogs and I had felt very, uh, I felt like they were trolly and I wasn't sure that they were legitimate. Now, if they're legitimately activists, great, and they're trying to move forward with, you know, creating awareness, awesome. I think that it's hard. We live in a world where uh, everything, like, if you read the comments right now, like, someone said she needs to be shot in the head. Like, you you see those types (laughs) of comments, right? And it's by, like, a white nationalist, like, username. So, like, you read those comments, and I'm sitting here, like, how, you know, who is this person? What are their stories? And whether or not I engage with them is important, but I look at A Voice for Men, and I read their blogs, and I'm like, well, they don't seem like they're going to listen to me anyways, so how are we may ever work together? And I will say that I didn't, I I don't know that I ever, um, I ever saw anti-feminists as not activists because in my head I see anytime you you um, put yourself out on the internet and you have a following and followings believe you and followings vote in your thought process, mm-hmm. your activism is there even if you don't know it is maybe mm-hmm. is how I see it. Like, I mean, I grew up in a world of, I don't know how much you know about my background, but you know, I'm Middle Eastern. My parents are from Iraq and like I, they immigrated here and they, they, you know, I was raised a Republican and I was in talk radio and I learned that there was this following, this need to feel like somebody knew what they were talking about, which is why I try really hard to only talk about things I know about, which is like mostly alternative relationships and lifestyles. Yeah. But when we're talking about feminism, I think it, versus MRAs, I think what we're talking about is like two very passionate sides that are so afraid of losing control and having to go back to the way things were or worse, the way things are. And so I think if we can just acknowledge that whether you acknowledge you're an activism or an activist or not, you're still trying to change the status quo. And that's good or bad, but I think you're still active in it. Do you think that if you care about uh, human rights issues and, yeah. um, and included in that are women's issues? Yes, of course. Do you have to then call yourself a feminist? I think all calling yourself a feminist does is it just allows other people to understand that you focus most of your energy because we're humans. We don't have an abundance of it Mm -hmm. on these particular issues. I actually believe that a perfect society would run where we all contribute what we can and what we know best. Like if you have a scientist who like is studied only in cancer, I don't expect him to then come on the other end of, you know, uh, being a scientist and 
space. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're different types of scientists. So like we yeah, can't sure. exert all of our energy covering all of the issues. I think it's really important that we say your skill set, your strength is here. Let's do it. And then your strength is here. Let's do it. Right. And then hopefully we can all come together in the end. But to acknowledge that there are disadvantages for groups, to acknowledge that maybe history hasn't been so kind to everyone is important. And I honestly, if you want to know the truth of it here, I'm going to just tell you nobody else can listen to this. <laughs> I really do believe that if people had just acknowledged the pain of people who were rising up and said, hey, I acknowledge your pain, what can I do to help you? Versus go fuck yourself, I have pain too. Then I think that maybe there would have been um, a little bit of a softer blow to the amount of hate towards one another. Because mm -hmm. I noticed that when I was struggling and the reaction from the communities that I had thought were, were friends to me, if they had just been kinder, I wouldn't have went full social justice warrior. I wouldn't have because I had always been safe in that camp. It was only until I felt like all of my skeptic friends were turning against me that I was like, well, I need somebody who will embrace me. And I went full so social justice warrior. Like, and I needed to come back from that. And I came back from that recently because people who, again, weren't threatened by me and my label said, come talk to me. So are you saying that you went full social justice warrior all, like as a reaction to the, the people that you considered your peers? because of the way that you that they um talk to you or from the way they, they the way that they you interacted my, with them they you know oh, they neglected your pain they neglected the fact that i was like struggling as like uh i felt like i i was taking care of my 16 year old brother at the time i was working like two jobs i was really struggling and i needed like a support system that that understood where the struggle was coming from yeah and i and i guess i all i kept hearing was um you know, like, you know, cry me a river, like move forward, like feminists suck. And I was like, are we sure? Like, is this how we want to go about, where's the community effort? Where's the raising of the money? Where's the community outreach? Like, and we saw it along the way. And I'm really proud of people who've done that and reached out. I'm saying they all were negative towards me, but I'm saying that I wish I had seen some kindness in people's faces. Now I saw that kindness on the feminist side and I still do. But what I also see is extreme passion and a lot of fear. And what I have seen at the outrage of like, I, you know, some people, one person in your chat before it even began was like, she's a Cat Black fan, like <laughs> run away. And the, the irony is that I enjoy Cat Black's content, though she and I like disagree on a few things, including the fact that she refuses to talk to people who oppose her. And that's her right. But I, I, it's a little bit of a disappointment because it stifles the conversation. So she has the right to not ex like exert herself and not to feel attacked. But I think that's what it is. They're afraid of feeling like they're just going to get on a podcast and talk to a person and that person's just going to tell them to go fuck themselves. Like, what if, what if you had brought me on this show just to like take my face and smear it in the mud and been like, this woman is so crazy. Go like, go to her page and thumb down everything. Like that's, that I think is the fear of most people and why they refuse to inter interact. My thing is that you could thumb down my video. It's not going to, change much in my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I didn't always feel that I was really afraid at one point and now I'm a grown-ass adult with enough of a, a wonderful audience and a following and I see some of you in the chat hi guys love you and I know that the people who really want to hear will hear and the people who don't won't but I never I do not expect everyone to be the same as me ever right. it's a convoluted concept and as someone who's always struggling to find the good in all her relationships, I'm trying my hardest to really see that. I see the pain in the struggle. I watched The Red Pill, and I only watched it once, which probably was a fault of mine. I should have watched it like four times so I could like get out the, you know, the bias as much as possible. But I saw the pain there. And I wish people could have understood that I really did see the pain there. And I felt, and I even cried a little bit during the domestic abuse story because that mm -hmm. was painful. Mm -hmm. That is painful stuff. And to say that it isn't is, is blinded. And I am disappointed. I'm sorry, I'm going on a monologue here. I am disappointed that so many feminists were like, this movie's like anti-women. You, you need to not see this. And I'm like, but you saw it, right? Like you saw it before you made that comment, right? Because I refuse to not, you know, consume the media before commenting on it. I can, mm -hmm. unless, I, unless I preface it with, I have not seen it. So here's my right. bias opinion. This concept of a victimhood has always been interesting to me because I made this video years ago on Daniel, Mr. Epstein's channel about like, we're all victims. So the concept is that if you acknowledge that we're all victims, you can acknowledge and start picking yourself up from that victimhood. And the victimhood is important. You have to acknowledge the pain. That's the emotional side. And then the logical side says, 
Now what are we going to do about it? And then you have to first have the first step of acknowledgement because you can't tackle a problem if you don't acknowledge it exists. But the victimhood shouldn't define you. It should, it should just be a part of your story. And then the other part of your story, what defines you is always what you do after, always. Mm -hmm. So picking yourself up, acknowledging you have the strength to do so, creating communities around you that implore and encourage you to be better. Those are all important attributes. And those, that's what makes a person. That's the story we should all want to tell is what we did after. Yeah, I, I guess I could see that. But then how do you define when, like, how do you define when someone simply experiences suffering, which everyone experiences suffering? What is the difference between that and essentially acknowledging uh, or, or um, claiming victimhood? Like, wh where do you draw the line? Because everyone goes through stuff and some of it's negative. But, um, and I mean, I'm speaking as somebody who you know, uh, and I'll, I'll just speak for myself here, because I'm, I'm more also a staunch individualist. I grew up in the uh, Humble Park area of Chicago in poverty from basically my whole life, right? Right now, I'm still pretty much below the poverty line, even though I do this job, and I'm able to live off of it. And uh, d despite the fact that, you know, these were not great conditions, like I lived in roach-infested apartments and shit like that as a little kid. But um, I don't consider myself to be a victim because a vi being a victim requires a oppressor or a victimizer. And I think that it's not that there was anyone that was setting out to do it w either you know, directly or indirectly. I think it was just people's conditions are not the same. Sometimes people are born into bad situations and um, sometimes they're not. And then they do what they can with what they have. So, you know, I was like... I, I acknowledge that even at my point in my life now, there were choices I could have made to make things better, but there are also choices I could have made that could have put me in a lot worse of a position. So I accept full responsibility for where I am, and I don't consider myself to be a victim. So, I mean, like, how do you know when you are a victim and when you're simply, you know, like, these are things that are outside of my control and, and you know, it's shitty, but I can fix it. Okay, so actually this is a good exploration into, um, let's talk about this for a second. Um, so I think of victimhood as like a direct, somebody came at me, I'm a victim of like theft or rape or, you know, assault. You know, I've been victimized, I've been targeted, I've been, you know. But then you think of victimhood as possibly the uh, result of what happened to your parents and the economic value you hold now. But I would agree and I'd be w willing to reassess that um, definition into suffering if you acknowledge that my parents suffered and that affected me, but now it's mm -hmm. my turn to affect my future kids. So sure. I'm okay with this. I, I, I think okay. I interchange maybe victim with suffering in a way that I probably shouldn't. Because it does create more of a hard line that is well, unnecessary. Yeah, because when you use the word victim, you basically say there is an oppressor somewhere. But when you say suffering, then that's more like, well, it could be anything. Like, my parents made bad choices, too. And so yeah. that doesn't make them my oppressors. That just means they made, made bad choices. And their parents made bad choices and so as long on, as right? we acknowledge as long as we acknowledge that the suffering is is valid like i don't want people to think that their suffering isn't invalid i mean we do this constantly with people and so sure. we never get to the root of the problem but i think we need to i mean i i literally run a channel on helping people be, have a sense of agency and like literally you are responsible for yourself you have to make good choices i don't care what your parents did and that's important like it's important but now you get to define your future and so that is so important to me but i have mm -hmm. to first feel like i acknowledge that yes you went through something so terrible you should get help for that and then in order to get help for that and or on the way to get help for that you will then create yourself into this perfect look whole human what did you mean by saying you feel as though you already took the red pill before you even saw this film? Um, so I, th I think that my experience of the film didn't feel like as I was moving through it, I, I nodded my head a lot as like, yes, of course, yes, of course, yes, of course. And a lot of it felt like I had already come to a consensus that humans were diverse and that people needed to be heard and that there were camps of you know feminists and anti-feminists that were just gruesome but i didn't feel like i that i needed to take a pill because if taking the pill means being anti-feminist i i i felt that that was un, un uh, 
I didn't think it was un, I didn't think it was clear enough of a concept. I'd like to think that I took the red pill because I can see both sides and I understand where the human part of this experience is. Mm -hmm. That's how that's what I think taking the red pill is. It's seeing the reality of the situation versus um, assuming that it's just so convoluted that it's it's one sided. Right, right. Do you think that people who take the red pill become uh, anti feminists per se? Uh, I well, it depends. I actually think that people who, um, if the red pill documentary hadn't come out and the the Reddit subreddit hadn't been created, right? If like the red pill was just a concept strictly from the movie when it came out initially, The Matrix, I think that I would argue that everyone should take the red pill because the red pill is like knowledge, and knowledge is ask Eve. She got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. That's a joke, <laughs> but like, yeah. it's it's literally terrifying and horrifying because you see the reality of, of the world, you know, and the concept of humanity. So I think everyone should take the red pill but i would argue that now that the red pill signifies this one concept it is hard not to see it as taking an anti-feminist propaganda down your throat why is it important that the men that were speaking uh on on men's rights were described as middle-aged and white i'm so glad you asked me this because this is the one thing i wish i could have clarified more in that whole fucking video so the only thought process that that mattered for me was that they had come from a generation where they had seen a society that was anti their freedoms. Mm -hmm. Because I, if you look at middle-aged white men specifically, they have a very specific, they had their story already written for them before they were born. And like these men came into the world having no choice what their, ex you know, and had very specific expectations. And I felt for them. I actually felt like they had been disadvantaged by their whiteness and their middle-agedness because of the generation they'd been born into. And I felt like I wish they had explored that more because I, you know, and I live in a Seattle progressive bu bubble where most of the men in my life who are white and who are cis and who are whatever, who are very wealthy because they're in tech, are actually like they're exploring parts of themselves that I've never seen middle aged men be allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And the, the amount of thought process that has changed and shifted because of generational differences is extreme. And I just wish there had been some acknowledgement. And I felt like I wish I had known if these men had known that. I almost wanted to be like, you know, you don't have to anymore. And you know, men don't have to. But then, and I do acknowledge this, I want everyone to understand that I do acknowledge this that I had moved from a conservative place into a progressive place. And now that I go back to conservative places, I acknowledge that they're still preaching the same concepts of masculinity and men have to be this to be men. So I acknowledge it still happens. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I wish it had been explored more because I felt for them the whole time. And I just wanted to like give them a hug and let them know, like, I swear to God, I, I understand. I just, I want you to understand too, that I, I don't have the expectations of you that aren't in your favor. Like, does that make sense? Does that yeah. correlate? Yeah, okay. no, I understand. Um, and I, I bring it up because I don't know if you've noticed that there has been a lot of um, shaming of yeah. white men, cisgender, heterosexual, etc. They're like yeah. the, the group that is totally okay to bash on. And if they ever speak up and they basically say, hey, you know, I have this issue... Uh, they get laughed out of the room by progressives, specifically, you know, that are essentially targeting them as though they are the enemy, even though, um, you know, I mean, most of them are just regular people that just, yes. they, they have their own problems, you know, and they're going through their own suffering. Yes. So I just thought um, it, it was just, you know, I, I wanted to ask you why you were pointed out to allow you a chance to clarify what you were saying. And I, you know, and that's the worst part of that, that section, because I knew that's what people were thinking. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, I like and I could have I could have easily like reassessed or rephrased or, you know, made sure that I added this in. But I, you know, when you're doing a 45 minute review of just like a documentary, your brain just, you know, but I wish I had because obviously I've dated white cis men. A lot of my friends are white cis men and I acknowledge and I really appreciate them as individuals. Mm -hmm. And I, and I understand, trust me, when I was like full SJW, like I get it, like saying, you know, fuck white cis, you know, white cis men feels really good because it's rooted in like some sense of like, I am powerful because fuck these people. But it's, it's rooted in a feeling of like convoluted concepts of like power. It's stupid. It's, it doesn't make sense. It's, a, it's an emotional response to, to anger. And I get it, but I no longer use terms or say things like that because it is a pure, I feel good right now, but okay. it does nothing, nothing right. for people because it's, it's not, not true. Helpful. It's a it's a generalization that's incorrect and illogical. But well, I understand why people get emotional. It, it also doesn't actually, you know, it doesn't actually start conversations. It's it, when no. you basically say, you know, oh, you're white mansplaining. Um, yeah. That's a way of ending a conversation. That's basically saying, I don't want to talk to you anymore because you're disqualified. Yeah.
it's still hard for me to think that there are in places in the world where like feminism is needed or even in the America where the thought process isn't needed, but I would argue wholeheartedly that, whoa, that was squeaky. I will argue wholeheartedly that the tactics are so, and what we're focusing on is so important. Like I could give you countless examples of times that feminists have been like, Brittany, be a part of this. And I'm like, uh, this isn't what, this is not, this is not even worth my time. Why are we doing right, this? Right, right. Like the man spreading campaign in New York, like drove my brain up the wall. Yeah. Where I was like, it, it, instead of asking men not to spread their legs, just say, excuse me, is anyone sitting here? May I sit next to you? Mm -hmm. Like, and same with women who put their bags on chairs. Like, instead of talking about human decency or having a conversation with your neighbor, they want to legislate, like, campaign laws about how to, how to, um, how to prevent people from doing things. It's a learned behavior. Sure. People, people don't maliciously spread their legs. They're just, you know, I'm sitting comfortably. And then you say, hey, excuse me, like, do you mind? Right. And so I, I do agree that, um, that what you just said is probably one of the biggest faults of most of these um, campaigns. I would also argue, and I think a lot of people neglect to acknowledge, that God bless their hearts and their enthusiasm, but so many of these feminists are just so young and so unaware of some of the things that have happened in the last 50 years that even I have to sit them down and be like, I know you're really passionate, but I just want to remind you that I grew up when Ellen was ostracized from communities, and you grew up where Ellen was like, the, the love of everyone's gay life and so like my experience of gay culture has been different from yours and I want you to acknowledge that we worked really hard to get here and so it's hard for them to understand that there was a fight that was battled and that what they're fighting now is sort of semantics and semantics are just going to exist and it comes down to the individual accepting the fact that okay well you do you and that's nice but I don't think sure. like you know, it's hard for me to want to sympathize with people that want to regulate speech. Like, I've always felt very uncomfortable with that idea because everyone is someone's hate speech. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Where do I get my morality from? How do I know what's right and wrong? Like, what, where, what's, what informs that? And then uh, feminism and lots of other human rights, um, you know, activist groups, they offer what I think is a, a, something to fill that hole no pun intended yes. so um i think that that's the reason why i'm making the correlation i don't think that atheism is bad just because it tends to lead to feminism i i um i'm just making an observation of what i see as a pattern so well i think humans in general they strive for consistency they strive for a community and they strive for structure so when they're looking for those things when they're kind of out in the wilderness like john the baptist i'm using so many religious references right now and they're looking for their messiah and so their messiah can look like feminism it can look like other things mm -hmm. um the things that i talk about on my channel specifically are like alternative relationships and lifestyles because i am a staunch atheist i don't believe in finding a god but i believe in finding structure and consistency so there are lifestyles that i can promote and i can utilize and i can say here like this is why people like this lifestyle there's like structure there yeah. um and that's why people strive for it and i don't think that's bad i just i think there has to be a, a correlation between um like there has not a correlation but there needs to be a logical assessment of you as an individual and what you believe in relation to the world and you need like i think the problem that most people have with the religious is that they try to make it political i mean we see that with like any what like name any large islam judaism or christianity like judaism sure. has its own little place which is kind of nice but like everywhere else is trying to instill it into the government law but I, I do think that there is a there is a logical leap like that's that makes so much sense to me that these these young people would leave religion and go to another political ideology i mean i was a humanist after i left religion and humanism was a place for me that made sense but it was too scattered and wasn't focused enough and i didn't know what we were doing because i couldn't expand myself so much to cover all topics and so feminism made sense to me because it allowed me to focus on one thing and put my sure. energy into the thing so okay I'll, let me uh, also i want to ask you this about religion too and this is like sure. a, this is a bit of a tangent have you ever seen uh jordan b peterson's lectures on this stuff okay um i thought uh that they'd be really interesting if you hadn't seen them that that he um i th i think it's pretty interesting stuff i just put it that way i don't know it doesn't necessarily change my position in terms of whether or not i believe in a higher power but yeah i think that when it boils down to what he's talking about there are many things there that i actually agreed with and have thought about myself which is essentially my feelings about religion is um it's not something that i'm going to practice but i don't have a problem with other people practicing it practicing it provided that they're not hurting anyone in the process 
Of course. So um, I think that's a pretty logical statement. Yeah, I mean, like, so. do do you and and you know enjoy? But I also think that by and large, um, for most people, religion is extremely useful, especially people who are really poor or you know um, live in poverty, because it gives them hope, basically. And I don't want to take that away from them. So. That's actually what we talk about. Like, I talk to staunch atheists that are like, we'll just destroy religion. And I was like, okay, but you can't take away a structure for millions of people who don't have anything else to rely on because they need it. They need it. It's why they're doing it. Like, people who need religion either A, believe in a god, or need the structure. Otherwise, they're just yeah. kind of like, they're flippy floppy. Not everyone's an alpha, guys. Like, we can't well, just and, do and then, uh, uh Well, I would ask you this, too. Do you think that uh, feminism for some people that left behind their religion is filling that gap like basically it's their religion yeah i mean think about it It comes with a, a great consensus a, a, a structure a community mm -hmm. uh, um and you get to be really empowered and say like i am the best and you are lowly so like there there is always that thing and that's what brings that's what creates the herd crazy mentality that i'm seeing happening that i'm like i'm uncomfortable with all of this the tribalism because right the tribalism and i believe in tribes and i believe in your your need for tribes but i also am uncomfortable with it because i don't always i don't fit in anyone's one tribe and so yeah. you get people like me who's constantly the outsider where i'm like i I don't feel comfortable in any of these places. Mm -hmm. So I found a few places where I feel uncomfortable and I kind of stick to those or those places. But most of them are with people who come from extremely either similar or different backgrounds, but also who are willing to hear me. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm talking about friends who have walked out of my life because I, I'm a product of the 90s. I say words that are not okay anymore. But uh, the people who have stuck around get it that I'm not coming from a malicious place, right? And, like, that's mm -hmm. the idea. People who are going to stay with you understand that your heart and soul come from a place of, like, they don't come from a malicious place, and I okay. think that's important. Do you think that feminists are anti-war because of the fact that men are dying? Uh, or do you think it is for another reason? For example, a lot of times feminists tend to be, um, they tend to vote Democrat, for example, and they tend to be yeah. against Republicans. And Republicans tend to, um, you know, spend money, uh, tax money on the military. And uh, they are often framed as, you know, uh, warmongers or at the very least um you know people that want to use they, they they feel a need for a really strong military and that could be the reason and this is the difference between standing for something and standing against something so if you're for something you might say well i just don't want all these men to die and i really care about the men dying if you're against something you're just saying look i just don't like the the war machine and um you know it does, i don't whether or not there's men dying is is not really as important um, okay, so uh, hear me out on this. So I think that there are feminists who are individuals who have different feelings on war. There are feminists in general that I think come to have come to the consensus that war is bad because it uproots people, it creates refugees, it, it puts a strain on the economy, it kills people. I would argue that their focus is like they'll say like women and children are dying and what they really should be focusing on is that humans are dying. And I think some feminists will say that like, oh, humans are dying. Um, and I think that's why they come from a place of like war is unnecessary. I would argue that war can be necessary and we should do it rarely. But I think that I come from a place, and I can only really speak for myself in terms of individual feminists, that war or, or drafting people and, and creating unnecessary deaths is bad for everyone. I mean, you're killing husbands and fathers and brothers, and you're 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 killing people who who probably don't even want to be there most of the time. And coming from a military background, like my fam, like my brothers, like mil even I like went into for the military, and I was like, you know what I mean? Like we all we all that was just a part of the culture. Like sure, you, either, you know it. There is a great pride there, but it doesn't mean that it's the best way for people to feel like they have to contribute to society all the time. So mm -hmm. as a whole, I think feminism is anti-war because it kills people. Right. I, but I think that comes from the humanist side. I think the logical side is that sometimes war is necessary, but nobody wants to really, it's hard for them to want to acknowledge that because that means mm -hmm. people have to die. So yeah. it's funny because I don't, I don't, after I saw the red pill, I did start to pay attention more as I listened to NPR and watched news uh, and to see how they kind of reported men. It's funny, though, and then I went to go research that kind of line of thinking, and I found this, um, like, feminist think post about semantics over words and how men were described as people and women were specified as women because they're not people. And it was an interesting concept because I think we're what? both just... So do you get, like, where they're coming? So, and so feminists are saying... Wait, wait, wait. So feminists uh, are saying uh, that when... Feminist. Okay, a, a feminist. Post. A post by a, a post. feminist. She yeah. said... Well, I mean, I don't... Well, okay, okay. A feminist said 
that mm -hmm. when there is a tragedy and the media writes about it and they write about the men as though they are people and they write about the women specifically as women, this feminist believes that those women are not people because they're not being described as people. So it's kind of funny because no matter how, and I kind of like, oh, okay, I see your thought process, but I'm pretty sure they're not maliciously thinking that hard about it. I'm pretty sure they're just specifying women and children because it hits our core of like, oh no, women mm -hmm. and children. And so like, that's how I see it. I see it as a campaign for the news to like hit the sympathy, like watch this, women and children are dying, but it's okay. You have to, and so, but then again, logically, I think it's more on the, the sphere of, you're right. I don't think that we necessarily sympathize with the death of men as much as we probably um, naturally should, instinctively sure. should. Like, I remember, it's so weird. I, I, I come from a, it's hard for me to rationalize. And that's what I'm trying to do as I hear these, like, stories. I'm trying to rationalize where people are coming from. It's hard for me because as a, fem even though I identify as a feminist and I, I feel comfortable with that label, I very much come and somebody asked, yes, I have eight brothers and one father and one sister and one mother. And so I come from a very male dominated culture where I looked and I saw the plight of men. Like I constantly felt sorrow for my father because he had one income to take care of 10 kids. Like yeah. that's amazing. And I always felt like that was unfair of my mother in some ways to like put that burden on him. But maybe that's the agreement they came to, right? Part of tradition. But it's weird because growing up and keep, bear with me, this is, sounds like a tangent, but it correlates sort of to the thought process of how people come who they are like because we're middle eastern we grew up watching like my father would have us watch the beheadings and watch the torture saddam would inflict upon the people mostly men because he wanted us to understand what we were against he wanted us to understand what they came from he wanted us to understand like people are bad and it actually it, it's about them wanting to just destroy other people and it was often men and boys that i saw being tortured because um that's just what the videos were and so in my head i always had this deep sense of protect our men and boys but protect our women and children protect our people and i think that makes it what that makes it easier for me to sympathize and empathize with people of of all different genders and identifiers because i see all i see is pain and all i see sure. is an inflicting of the pain and it kills me like it kills my soul and a soul <laughs> a part of me i get where people are coming from and i i wish that they would just see that they're they're all just like, it's an expression of pain. Like you feeling like people devalues men and feminist feeling like people devalues women. is just like, guys, we all feel devalued. Now we need to move on from it. Like we need to make a bigger, better world for each other. I take great pride in listening to people because it's so interesting. And I really mm -hmm. wish, like, I understand all these, like, young protesters are so passionate. And I, I, I hear their passion. I do. But I wish they would take a moment to sit down and understand that what they're listening to is years and years and years of people's stories and people's struggle and people's legal, like, rights being taken away. And I, and I 100%, after seeing, like, listen, I think we all have those stories in our families, right? We can make it as personal as we want. Oh, my uncle was fucked by his wife who, like, took the legal system and took his kids. Like, we all should be able to do that. And that's how you garner sympathy for the opposition. Mm -hmm. But I think people have sort of forgotten even how to do that. Like, there was a campaign of feminists who said, stop stop talking about women as as people's like daughters and wives to humanize them start talking about them as humans but to be honest i don't think that's how people inherently work like i think instinctually we want to only have sympathy for tribes so we have to understand them as tribe so i don't think that's a bad way to do it and i and i really was disheartened by in the video the red pill in the in the documentary seeing those protesters stop the mras or a voice for men from speaking because i thought they could have at least understood what they were trying to say and and then challenge them with that like i i could have done better maybe on my review of the red pill but at least i tried to watch it and i did watch it and i took my notes and i did my best and maybe i'm not the best person to like represent like people in the comments are like does she represent like i don't represent all feminist people i represent Brittany and like feminist thought that i under how i understand it and how i can express it to you but i am just a person and i am only mm -hmm. trying to to make the world a better place hopefully like that's the idea right but sure. what i think is subjectively better might not match up with yours and that's where we go but i promise you i'm trying to listen i promise you i'm, I'm enjoying this immensely thank you so much for having me the things that i think i notice ties feminism together and it's the thing that makes it different from let's say just being a women's rights advocate okay okay um and the main difference is is that feminism has a couple of uh, concepts. One of them is patriarchy. It's the main one. And the patriarchy yes. 
as defined by feminists, is a system of uh, so a societal system or a cultural system wherein men are in power and mm -hmm. they basically built it to benefit them and to keep them in power mm -hmm. and women are uh it's it's to the it's the benefit of when, men and to the detriment of women and that's how mm -hmm. it's set up okay that's a central feminist tenet that's basically where it comes from is the idea that women have historically been disadvantaged and it's because of a system that men built for with men's interest in mind do you mm -hmm. agree with that as a definition of patriarchy in terms of uh, your brand of feminism uh, i'll agree with the definition of patriarchy being what you just explained as i think it's pretty accurate and i would argue that w the patriarchy is something that existed it's something that exists in certain aspects i mean if, if I think I have a hard time with this word because it's so triggering for people and people get very like up uppity about it. Sure. And I think what we need to focus is for me, I think the patriarchy now in modern society is kind of like ill-intentioned good. And I think like it's a so societal concept more than a systematic concept. I mm -hmm. actually would argue that it's more social. And because it is social, we, is, we influence politics with it and therefore the system. But I don't like if you look at the way that the government is is done right now i think we have the the ability as women to be represented in government i think the only problem is that the people who are ruling on a lot of these things happen to be men but that's why we need to encourage more representation in like politics so i think patriarchy is a social construct like a social societal expectation of behavior to keep things moving forward more than a systematic one now and i think right. that's something that is just it's easier to comprehend i think for people and it's also what we actually face like we face men who think they have to buy us dinner right that's stupid and like silly and like that's based off of like a hierarchy of like we do the thing and you do the thing and that's that's all like very ridiculously like social nuances and i think i wish i would i wish you know coming from a religious place like you could say like catholicism is a patriarchal like religion and like priests will be the top and then the pope and they're all men and they'll say like women are valued just as much as men but they'll never let them empower like that's patriarchy right that's like an idea that the patriarchal system should rule because somehow they represent god better and like it's a silly system but there will always always be people who benefit from either or i i just feel like this is too convoluted of an idea to hit in a podcast for 10 minutes but or mm -hmm. a, a show but i i would say that i look at it more as a social issue than a systematic one thank you Brittany simon that was uh it was a good conversation thanks for coming good. on I'm so glad. And thank you guys really appreciate uh, yeah yeah no problem leave your comments in the comment section uh you know say whatever you want but i appreciate it if it was constructive <laughs> but say whatever you want i'm not going to tell you what to say what to do and uh yeah that's it for us here at the fireside chat i want to thank Brittany again for taking time to come out and i want to thank you guys for watching i think we capped out at about 500 people which is pretty fucking sweet and uh we'll see you guys on the next show remember to uh like subscribe share